guys as we close off with Wayne Dyer and his wisdom the last one I wanted to share with you is stop finding excuses so this one is very very challenging for us because many of us including myself including every single person even the greatest thinkers have been limited by the excuses that they have found for themselves we have conditioned ourselves if we can accept the bitter truth that we have allowed things that have happened outside of us to affect us on the inside, then we can really begin real change. But it's very difficult and you have to stop making excuses. It's a difficult one, but if you stop making excuses, you now empower yourself to make changes with that power that you have, with that space between that stimulus and response. So between what happens outside and what you choose to do on the inside. Have a great morning, everyone. Rise and shine, it's espresso time. Good morning, Believe Nation. It's Evan. I am not a morning person, but here's what I know. When you start your day with a powerful routine that inspires you, it will change your life, like watching these videos. And in celebration of my recent one-on-one -on -one with Les Brown, get ready for a shot of espresso from our vaults with Les Brown. I wake up every morning. So keep me going. I'm saying this is a time more than ever that you want to begin to inoculate yourself with positive words, coming to conventions, showing up on meetings, being on the calls to make yourself unstoppable, to get out of your mind the polluting negative thoughts that's causing most people to go through life being stuck because they're volunteer victims. Somebody said that many people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65 because they got so much garbage in their minds. You are here because you've got a clear vision of what you want and where you're going. Give yourselves a round of applause. Come on, bring your energy level up. Yes, yes. You want more. You want more. You're different. You're different than everybody else.
Don't worry if they don't get it. Don't try and convince people to do this business. A person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. You are not like everybody else. You can walk outside and find pigeons, but if you're looking for eagles, it's going to take you a minute. You are different. It's lonely at the top. How many of you know it's lonely at the top? Raise your hands. It's lonely at the top, but you eat better. That's what I'm talking about. You're different. One great entrepreneur said, I choose not to be a common man. It's my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dulled by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to live from hand to mouth. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the still calm of utopia. I will never cow before any master, nor bend to any threat. It's my hair is to stand erect, proud and unafraid to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. You showed up because you're building a business that you can stand and say, I did this. I did this. This is my dream. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yes. 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 Your difference is how you're going to win. Whatever makes you you, is how you're going to win, is how you're going to stand out, is what's going to attract like-minded people to you, and that is how you're going to have ultimate success. If people cannot tell the difference between you and somebody else, then you're going to lose. It's just going to be based off of price. If I can't tell the difference between your service or your product and 100 other people who are selling the exact same thing, why would I ever, why would I ever pick you? I'm going to pick the person whose name I recognize, whose commercials I've seen, or who charges the lowest price, right? Like, at the end of the day, if I can't tell the difference, at all, you're gonna go with the lowest price. And that is, a, that is a race to the bottom. That is not the game that you wanna play. And this is your biggest advantage as an entrepreneur. Like this is how you beat the big companies. You're not gonna beat them on your name recognition and on your branding. You're gonna beat them off of your story. And so many entrepreneurs are just trying to look like big companies. Your website, you copy off big companies, you wanna look professional, you, you know, have similar artwork to everybody else. And it's not that you need to be unprofessional, you need to be you. You need to let this thing inside you come out. I need to know your story. I need to feel your passion. You're going to win because I feel the connection to you as a human being for why you're starting this business as opposed to working for some big company. Why would I ever go to some big company that's not really going to care about me? I'm going to come to you because I know you. I feel like I can connect with you. And a lot of you guys comment on my videos and you connect with my story even though I don't know anything about you yet or a little bit in the comments, right? By creating content, whether that's through social media or on your website or in all your marketing materials, telling the story, creating content, allows people to feel like they know you. And when people feel like they know you, they're gonna to wanna to do business with you. This is why I believe it's really important to figure out what your one word is. That's why I wrote the book. Like, what do you stand for as a human being? And then bring that to your business. I'm about believe. And so all of my videos are about believe. It's always positive, it's always encouraging. I believe you have insane potential. My, my goal is always to help bring that out in you with every piece of content that I make. I don't always succeed, not every video is fantastic, but I'm trying, it's the intention. I never put out a video that is negative or attacking or saying this person sucks or people fighting against each other. It just goes against my core values. And not everybody likes that, that's okay. Like, lots of people don't like the message believe. Lots of people are negative and haters and the little men and they're, you know, they want content of people fighting with each other. They don't resonate with my channel. That's okay. They go somewhere else. There's lots of places to go to on YouTube and on the internet to find people hating on each other. The people who come to me, who watch my videos, you guys, are the ones who like the message of believe, like the positive, uplifting, courageous message. And that's who I end up attracting. The people who like that like me more. And so I'm attracting people who like me, who have the same kind of values, who want to make a positive impact in the world. And so that's what I want for you. I want people to be able to recognize. You can recognize the difference between me and somebody else, me and another YouTuber. Pick, pick another YouTuber that you like and you put us against each other just in terms of values and the kind of content we create. You can tell the difference. You can explain what I do and you can explain what they do. How do people explain what you do and why it's different? I want people to love your message or self-eliminate. Say, you know what? That, Believe is a stupid message. I don't want any part of it. Awesome. Great. Like, go off and do your thing. No problem. Just don't hang around us and leave hate. Right? 
And so figuring out what your one word is, what your most important core value is, and then bringing that out into your business. It's not a word for your business, it's a word for you personally that you bring to everything that you do so that you can attract the people who feel the same way. And those people will love you and they'll buy more from you and, and they'll pay higher prices for you and they'll refer their friends to you. You need to have that word of mouth referral marketing in any entrepreneurial company because we can't afford to take out Super Bowl commercials. You being you, recognizing your difference and loving that and bringing that out and being courageous enough to say, here's what I stand for. Here's the mark that I want to make. Here's why I started my company. It's scary, right? Because people will judge you and that's okay. But it also shows how you're different. And those people who love that message will flock to you. And you get to be around customers, employees, partners, suppliers, investors, who believe the same thing that you believe, who love your difference and who want to be a part of it. But if you don't have clarity on that, then you just look like everybody else. And it's a race to the bottom and you're competing on price. Now I've got some special bonus clips that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? When you just watch a video and you get motivated, the sign says you have a 35% chance of actually following through. That's not good enough, Believe Nation. We need to take some action. But when you watch a video, you get motivated and you create a specific plan of action, that number jumps from 35% to 91% chance of you following through. And when you publicly commit to other people, like leaving a comment down in this video, your number jumps to 95% chance of you actually following through on the plan you set for yourself. So I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Leave it down in the comments below so I can celebrate you. What I like for Good afternoon, guys. When you start to believe and live with determination of the truth of who you really are, that you are more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine, when you start living that truth, you will realize how important every decision you make is. So I want you to try that now, wherever you are. Once this video is over, let's see the power of that. Let's see the power of that claim. And what I want you to do is the first negative thought that may enter your mind when this video is done, I want you to examine very carefully what part of that thought is under your control. And I'm sure most of you will realize that it's all under your control. So more specifically, what can you do with that thought? What's the positive aspect? What's the part that you have control over in the situation that may be negative? Hope this helps everyone. Have a great afternoon. I like it when I can make an investment in a company. And in three or four years, I can get all my money. If you're going to take all your money and put it into the market today, into the index, that's probably not the best idea. I think the single greatest skill an investor needs uh, to do well is extreme patience. Hello, Believe Nation. In today's video, I get to sit down with one of the world's greatest investors and pick his brain about investing, building wealth, and what made him so successful as an investor and what he's looking for in today's investments. Now, he's not only changed my life through his values, teachings, and principles, but he's impacted countless of lives within the investment community. He started the Pabri Investment Funds in the early 2000s, right after the dot-com bubble, and since then has had a rate of return of 671 plus for his investors. He's not only an amazing investor, but he's also a philanthropist, starting the Dakshima Foundation in India, helping pull kids out of poverty and putting them through the IT program to change their lives and their families' lives. 
He's also written an amazing book that's highly regarded within the investment community called The Dondo Investor that I would highly recommend you check out if you're looking to dive more into investing. So with that said, I hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy the interview. The first question I wanted to ask you would be, with the S&P 500 um, being at a PE of 40, um, and things kind of just out there in uh, you know all-time highs, uh, do you see any resemblance between the dot-com bubble and what's going on and any caution that you um, feel right now in the markets? Yeah, well, I think the, the dot-com bubble was uh, more widespread. Um, it was a little, you know, each of these bubbles have their own uh, nuances and characteristics. Uh, it, during the dot-com bubble, what happened is that uh, a bunch of businesses that really had uh, no revenues and uh, not really much more than a website had uh, uh, gotten some crazy valuations and so on. Um, and it was pretty widespread in the sense that uh, uh, people could create any kind of dot com and, uh, you know, it would get venture funding and, and uh, kind of go from there. And some of that had spilled into the mainstream S&P stocks like Things like uh, Coca-Cola was pretty highly priced, Microsoft, Cisco Systems, and so on. And later, all these stocks crashed and burned. So there was a bubble in the dot-coms. There was also a bubble in tech. And there was a bubble in uh, what, what I would call maybe, um, you know, well-recognized blue chips. Uh, if you look at the situation today, uh, I think it's much narrower. Uh, in the sense that uh, the real bubble is in the Robin Hood names or the uh, Wall Street bet names. Uh, so um, uh, maybe you can add Bitcoin to that uh, to that mix as well. Uh, so it's it's much uh, much narrower uh, than than what we had before. Uh, we do have uh, some sim similarities in the sense that we have stretched valuations. In, uh, in a number of uh, sexy tech businesses, uh, you know, Salesforce, Microsoft, uh, Alphabet, Airbnb, all of those uh, kinds of businesses. Uh, so there's, there's some euphoria there, but it is nothing like what's happening with the Robinhood names and so on. And then when you get past uh, this core, uh, then uh, I think uh, it is questionable whether we have stretched valuations. Uh, because we have very low interest rates, and if those low interest rates persist, uh, you know uh, that that actually impacts uh, long-term stock valuations. Mm -hmm. So, so I think the uh, the there is definitely a bubble, uh, but the bubble is much narrower. And in terms of the the popularity with the uh, escaping the mutual funds and the high costs. <coughs> Um, and, and going over to the indexes, do you see a bubble within the indexes forming or do you still think there is, you know, more room for that to grow down the road? Well, I mean, I think the, uh, the S&P is clearly at elevated valuations. Um, if, if an investor is young and going to dollar cost average over a long period of time, uh, the S&P 500 is just fine. If you're going to take all your money and put it into the market today, into the index, um, that's probably not the best idea. Mm. So if, if you're a young, young investor, you've got decades of uh, compounding ahead of you, then I, th I don't think it matters. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms, of, in terms of with the low interest rates um, and there's still being room for growth, do you see... Uh, an adjustment in the PE ratios that we should be expecting from companies. I know in one of your earlier talks, you, um, and I know you've recently switched to going after spawners um, as opposed to the discounted pies. Uh, and I was curious to know in terms of, you know, thou shall not invest in a company over a PE of 10, um, should we be setting new barometers uh, within, you know, acceptable P's that we'll just have to gulp down, essentially? Well, I would say that if you, if you step, uh, if, you, if you move from indexing to 
picking individual stocks, uh, that is a significant step change. Um, so, uh, so if you're if you're going to pick individual stocks, then you've got to have a very good idea of what kind of cash flows uh, those individual businesses are likely to produce over the next five or ten or fifteen years. And if you have a good handle on that, then you can work backwards and discount those cash flows and come up with a intrinsic value for a business. Uh, most humans would not be good at doing that. Mm -hmm. And most companies do not lend themselves to that type of uh, forecasting that's relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. So, so I, would, I would be reluctant to, uh, to suggest that individual investors look at individual stocks um, because uh, a price to earnings ratio is one data point. Uh, it's not the be all and end all of investing. It's, it's a single data point. It has relevance, uh, but it also may not have relevance in the case of many businesses. Mm. And so in terms of um, distinguishing that, that the two people who um, are interested, the vast majority who maybe should take the indexes and dollar cost average, um, if they're not willing to take on the approach of diving into specific companies, mm -hmm. um, the, the next step up for those individuals, and then I, I do really want to come back to the specific individuals who are curious um, to dive into specific companies as well. But uh, I guess going back to the general uh, mass, uh, in terms of investing in an index versus something like Berkshire Hathaway, which is an index of itself, of course, um, and maybe taking that pursuit versus the index, uh, do you see the Berkshire uh, Hathaway having a long run even after Charlie and Warren uh, part ways with it, essentially? I hope they're still around for <laughs> 20 years plus, but... Um, yeah, one could one could think of uh, Berkshire kind of sort of like an index, uh, though that's a little bit of a stretch. And I think that in today's environment, it would not be a bad idea if you were dollar cost averaging over a long long time to do fifty percent S and P and fifty percent Berkshire. Mm. Uh, that's not a bad way to go, and uh, I think both are valid. It's 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 difficult for me to. Uh, be clear which one would do better over the next five or ten years. That's not clear to me. Do you still think Berkshire does? Uh, it comes down to, I guess, the the management of Berkshire and how much Charlie and Warren have built Berkshire. Do you still see uh, the potential uh, value within Berkshire even after those individuals have? Yeah, I don't think it will matter. I mean, clearly Warren and Charlie are exceptional. Uh, but they have a deep bench and uh, they have some really good managers and uh, they have done a lot of planning for succession. Uh, so I think that the, the bigger challenge for Berkshire is not so much the transition for Warren and Charlie, it's uh, the problem of size. And uh, they already face that problem today with Warren and Charlie in the mix. So, uh, so size is a major factor which will uh, serve in a, as an anchor to their performance. But uh, they've pulled rabbits out of hats and they will kind of do that. Okay, and in terms of the, um, the specific investor who is willing to dive into the companies um, and going back to uh, thou shall not invest in PE of 10, um, you know, looking at a company, because uh, the audience is, is very mixed between people who should take the index investing approach, dollar cost in Berkshire, um, but we do have a lot of Warren Buffett <laughs> disciples and individuals. Um, and so I guess in terms of the, when looking at companies, uh, looking at, for example, spawners uh, like Costco, for example, that you talked about, um, I believe it was two talks ago. Um, and seeing that maybe there is a case to be made where they're not, they do have room to grow? Yeah, I think Costco is a very good example. I think Costco is an uh, incredible business. 
And uh, I think it's a business that will be much larger in the future. Um, for example, they just opened one store in China, uh, which was mobbed. Uh, and uh, they, they, they couldn't even let the people in because there was so much demand. Uh, shelves got cleaned out. Um, it is entirely possible that in 10 or 20 years, there are hundreds of stores of, uh, of Costco in China. And it's uh, also possible that at some point, the Chinese business of Costco may be bigger than the American business of Costco. Um, and Costco is in very few countries. They're just in a handful of countries. So uh, Costco could enter more countries. So I think there's many ways for Costco to grow quite significantly from where they are at today. But that does not mean that it would be a great long-term investment. So a business doing well in the future um, is usually a requirement for you to do well as an investor. Uh, but just because the business does as well, uh, does not mean you will do well. So Costco is not cheap by traditional metrics today. Um, the future of Costco is well understood by the markets and many investors who have who are willing to pay up for it. It would not be clear to me whether it's better to invest in Costco or better to invest in Berkshire, or better to invest in S&P 500. Uh, between those three, I couldn't tell you uh, which one to do well. I, I would say this, that uh, while I admire Costco tremendously, at current prices, I would not be a buyer of the stock. In terms of making that distinguishing factor of not just with Costco, Costco just being the example of, um, you know, Charlie, for example, saying, you know, it's better to pay for a wonderful business at a fair price than, um, you know, a, de a decent business at a at an attractive price. Um, with with an example like Costco, where it's it's not cheap, um, like you just said, with the current business, um, how would you assess the risk for individuals who did want to take on that pursuit of not just Costco but any business, where you're investing in the potential of something or multiple factors going right versus investing in the underlining business of what's already gone right? Okay, so you know, that's uh, just to highlight why the individual stocks is a is fraught with peril. Let's just uh, dive a little deeper into Costco, uh, just so I can express what I'm trying to get to. So the market cap of Costco today is a little over 145 billion. Okay, and what Yahoo Finance is showing me is that the trailing P.E. ratio is 33, 33.72. Let's just make the math simple. Let's say the market cap is, um, uh, you know, let's say it's 150 billion and let's say the P.E. is 30, for example. Okay, so uh, what that means is that uh, Costco earned $5 billion in the last 12 months. And uh, it will have some earnings stream coming out in the next 10 or 20 years. Okay. And let's say, for example, Costco's earnings, uh, I mean, let's just take a, and I haven't done this math before, I'm going to do it on the fly with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's take a very bullish case on Costco. And let's say that Costco is able to double its earnings every five years, you know, so 15% uh, rate of earnings growth, which would be uh, quite high. Um, so what that would mean is that they would be making around 10 billion in five years, and they'd be making around 20 billion in 10 years. And so if you look at the, the next 10 years of cash flows, which start at 5 billion and end at 20 billion. Uh, all those cash flows uh, together, uh, I mean, uh, we, we have to do the math on that, but basically uh, I'm just guesstimating it may be around maybe 100 billion or so or less in total. Then you would discount those back, you know, with some interest mm -hmm. rate or something, you take those back you might discount it by 5% or something, I don't know. So the thing is that it's a business that you 
put out $150 today and you get back uh, less than $150 in the next 10 years after some very robust growth and assuming no hiccups, uh, that does not strike me as the most exciting place to invest. Now, if we did the same math with GameStop or Tesla or you know Salesforce, for example, the math would look even more ridiculous. I mean, Costco is not in a bubble. It's not very overpriced. It's you know, it's a very great business. Uh, but still, you can see that. And so uh, I like it when I can make an investment in a company. And in three or four years, I can get all my money back. Right? I mean, if I, can, if, if I could invest $150 in Costco and in the next four years, the earnings were more than that, well, that'd be a great investment. But that is not in the cards. For for the individuals out Good evening, guys. I want to share with you today, as we live, laugh, and love our way to infinite mind wealth, a thought about uh, being a parent. And the reason why I want to use this example is to highlight how powerful our emotions are. Our emotions are energy. So I want to give this personal example. Um, there's uh, been a time, or many times, when you know I'm asking my children to do things that I know they need to get done, and you know they may not listen at first, and they're continuing on that path. And then I'll get to a point where I have built up anger, negative emotion to the point where I raise my voice perhaps and show that definiteness of purpose to get them to do what I'd like them to do. And sure enough, it gets done. So what is it? And I'm not suggesting that we should yell or be angry with our children or with anybody. But what I'm suggesting is that power of that energy of emotion, if we channel it and use it the right way, that's our power. We can do anything great that we want to do. Have a great evening, everyone. People who are happy, passionate, and successful are everywhere, right? Can't we just turn to them to see what they did to get there? Not quite. A few years ago, Gallup conducted an international poll that included questions about workplace happiness and engagement. How many people said they felt engaged at work? Was it A, 65%, B, 35%, or C, 15%? If you guessed A, you're way off. The answer is C. Only 15% of people worldwide said they felt engaged at work. That means that 85% of people around the world don't find meaning and purpose in what they do. Considering that, according to writer Gemma Curtis, we spend 13 years and two months of our lives at work. That's a lot of time being upset. But when we look around, we see a different story, right? Social media posts show people pursuing their dreams and living their best lives. And news and interviews showcase entrepreneurs stumbling on that great idea, creating a company and selling it all before age 25. Yet as we just saw, the statistics don't bear this out. In Japan, a whopping 94% of survey respondents said that they're not engaged at work. It's a bit better in the US, but not much. Only 30% of workers say they're happier with their work. This is colliding with what Gallup says is an increased focus on the value of work among millennials. They want a job and a career that's dream worthy. Keep dreaming, it was worth a shot. So in a world that's so unhappy at work, how do we make that dream come true? There's a single powerful secret I'm gonna share that will help you sort it all out. There's a Zen story about two monks standing in the garden of the monastery, watching some prayer flags waving in the distance. One monk comments, the wind is moving. The other monk shakes his head. No, he says, it's the flags that are moving. A senior monk walks by and the two monks ask his opinion. 
He said, you are both wrong. It is your mind that is moving. That's the powerful secret that in life, it's actually less about what you experience and more about how you experience it that's important. The truth is actually less about what job you have and more about how you do it that shapes the quality of your life. That actually makes a lot of sense. Katrina Lake didn't know what to do after college, so she decided to work at a consulting firm. It was there that she became curious about what would happen if you married technology with clothing retail. Her initial idea flopped, but she kept exploring, going on to work for a venture capital firm, then on to business school. Finally, Lake had her big idea. She would marry personal shopping with online clothes buying. She started shopping for her friends and keeping meticulous data about what they liked and didn't and why. Business plan and spreadsheets in hand, she began to search for funding and was turned down by more than 50 different venture capitalists. That didn't stop her though. Periodically, she would get just enough money to keep going and building her idea. In 2017, Lake became the youngest woman in history to take a company public, and in 2020, Stitch Fix was valued at $3.37 billion. Lake did an interview with the podcast Skimmed from the couch and was asked the worst piece of advice she'd ever gotten. What was it? Follow your dreams. Lake says the notion that your job should be your dream job is misleading. So many parts of this job have not been a dream, she said. Whether it was struggling to raise money, cramming to get Stitch Fix boxes out the door on time, or being the one who had to go out and buy a new printer when theirs broke down. Here's the thing, you can be a stockbroker who makes millions of dollars, but is miserable. Or you can be a grocery clerk who changes others' lives simply with your kindness and caring. The difference lies in how you approach life. And that difference comes from your motivation. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, manage time intelligently. According to writer Gemma Curtis, each of us has on average 28,835 days in our lives. Of that time, we spend 33 years in bed, seven of them trying to fall asleep. One year and four months exercising, unless you're my wife, I'm guessing we'll spend something like five years exercising, she loves it. We spend 11 years and four months on non-work screen time. And eight years and four months of that is spent watching TV with the rest on social media. In fact, we spend six times longer watching TV and two times longer on social media than exercising. Yet experts say that even just 10 minutes of exercise a day would increase the overall quality of our sleep. 10 minutes? See how it's all interconnected? We'll also spend about three years on vacation. That might sound like a lot, but compare that to the 13 years and two months we'll spend at work. Unless you're Elon Musk, who says he spent 15 years working 100 hours or more a week, he's been known to sleep under his desk. Ladies, most of you will spend about 136 days getting ready. Guys, it's about 46 days for you, unless you're me. We spend four years and six months eating. 66% of workers say they eat meals at their desks. We spend 235 days waiting in line. After all of that, it's no wonder that we spend just one year and three days of our lives socializing. But here's some good news. We spend about 115 days of our lives laughing. <laughs> it's pretty shocking, right? Who knew we were spending so much time on things we probably don't really care about and so little on the things we do? Here's the thing, and I say this in my book, Think Like a Monk. No matter what you think your values are, your actions tell the real story. Sure, there are things we have to do, like go to work, but when we have free time, we dedicate that time to what we value. You may say and even believe that you value time with your partner or your kids most of all, but when you have spare time, time, you're more often scrolling on your phone or with your friends. There's a well-known saying by Ben Franklin, and it's worth remembering. It goes, when you take care of the minutes, the hours will take care of themselves. When we don't spend our time on what we value, mostly that's not on purpose. It's because we're simply not paying attention. 
Part of that is because for a lot of us, by the time we have spare time, we're wiped out and it's just hard to get motivated to change gears. I need my sleep. The other reason we waste time is we discount the value of our minutes. You're probably familiar with the dreaded time gap. That's what I call the mysterious black hole where our missing time goes. You know, when you're at work and you sit down to do something, but then a headline pops up on your news alerts and you click on it and the next you look at the clock, it's 45 minutes later and you don't know where the time went. Or when you get home and you're about to change your clothes to get some exercise, but first you just want to forward this hilarious meme to a friend and then all of a sudden, 90 minutes have gone by and you're still sitting on your couch. I must have lost track of time. We lose time because we treat our minutes like dimes. A dime isn't worth much to most, right? It's just like 10 cents. If we were walking down the street and saw a dime, most of us wouldn't even stop to pick it up. According to data from Provision Living, the average American spends 324 minutes on their phone every day. If you measured that in dimes, over a single day you'd have enough money to pay for a drop in yoga or meditation class. Over seven days you'd have enough to pay for organic groceries for a week for two people. Over a month you could take a long weekend at a deluxe Airbnb. But let's say you didn't spend those dimes but instead put them in a basic savings account. By the end of the year you'd have 11826 but forget dimes, in actual minutes, if you spend just an hour less on your mobile phone per day, you'd have an extra 21,900 minutes per year. That's a lot of time saved and a lot more time to do the things that support you, your health, your well-being, along with the other things and people you value. Rule number three, avoid negativity. It's one of the biggest and most common things that wears us out and weighs us down every single day, starting from the time we wake up negativity. Doesn't it often feel like everywhere you look, most of the headlines and social media posts, even messages from your friends and family are negative? Why does it seem like no matter where we turn, negativity is just coming at us from every direction? I'm not about that negativity. When it comes to negativity, research tells us some interesting things about human behavior. Scientists from McGill University set up a study that participants were told was about observing their eye tracking patterns while they read news from a web page. Really, the scientists just wanted to see which articles the participants picked and overwhelmingly it was negative articles. But why? Another study reported in Adweek showed that on average negative headlines outperform positive headlines by 63% and data from Pew Research says that two-thirds of Americans say they feel worn out by the sheer amount of news that's out there. Just the quantity is tiring and negative. It's way too much. It's just too much. Researchers also estimate that up to 80% of our thoughts every day are negative. So I'm going to give you three ways to lighten your negativity load so you can start feeling more energized and positively engaged. Scientists have concluded that our overconsumption of negativity is due, at least in part, to something called negativity bias. We're wired to detect threats, so we give more of our attention to things that are negative. So let's say you're out on a hike in a gorgeous location. There might be 99 beautiful things to take in about your surroundings. The birds, the trees, the cascading waterfall. But the second you hear a little rustle in the bushes, all of your attention will go to that one sound because your brain is worried it could be a threat. Did you hear that? There's also research that sheds some light on what encourages negativity in our social circles. According to neuroscientists, certain receptors for dopamine, the reward chemical, actually become unavailable when we don't give a socially desirable response to others. If your friends say, let's go to the ABC Grill for lunch, you're more likely to get that feel-good dopamine hit if you say, sounds great, even if that's not what you want to eat. Our brains want us to fit in. If you've ever participated in gossip or other negative behavior and then wondered why you did that, this helps to explain it. Well, I feel better about myself. The negativity odds may feel like they're stacked against us, but we really can decrease the negativity in our lives. And we do it through small, simple choices made consistently. Going along with your friends, even though you disagree, is like someone offering you a sugary candy bar. It's hard to resist and tastes great in the moment, but later you feel the weight of that choice when you're burned out, tired, potentially depressed. I made a mistake. That food analogy can be helpful when looking at the negativity in our lives. Like junk food, junk thoughts and junk behavior are weighing us down. If I'm giving myself a steady diet of refined sugar and processed food, if that's what I'm ingesting, I'm going to be tired and cranky. I'm awake. 
But if I eat lots of fresh produce, if I'm consuming things that are more positive, I'm going to feel energized. I'll feel more motivated, my mood will be better, and my thoughts will be clearer. And that makes it easier to make healthy decisions. It's self-perpetuating. Have you ever found it when you're tired, you eat worse? When you eat worse, you're more tired. If our daily diet is made up of judgment and anger, we're gonna feel terrible. We won't be as creative and we won't feel inspired. Studies even show we won't be as physically healthy because people who are mostly negative get sick more often. Rule number four, find your core values. It all starts in childhood. We want to be loved and accepted. That's completely normal. But because of this need for love and acceptance from just a few years of age, we begin to live according to what others want for and from us. We form ideas about who and how we should be based on what parts of us, our behavior and personality, are welcome and praised and which are not. I like that about him. We also learn by imitating what we see others doing. As we grow older, we shape our likes and dislikes according to the people we surround ourselves with. For example, according to data from Adweek, among 18 to 34 year olds, 68% said that their peers' social media posts were at least somewhat likely to influence them to make a purchase. I, I, I got one for myself, see? Soon these attitudes and behaviors we're imitating become indistinguishable to us from who we really are. What have I become? In a pair of studies, researchers reviewed data from three different seasons of the Premier League football play and concluded that referees systematically favored home teams by shortening close games where the home team is ahead and lengthening close games when the home team is behind. The reason? Pressure from the home crowd. So when it comes to making decisions, we change our own picture of reality to avoid the discomfort that comes when we go against what others think. And that's just strangers. Imagine the influence of our friends, our families and coworkers and the effect they have on us. Yeah, but I'm your brother, we're family. What finally does make us question our thoughts and behavior is often that we hit a wall. Maybe we wake up one day and realize we're dreading going to work. Maybe we're sitting with a group of friends and suddenly we think, what am I doing here? I don't fit in with these people. And then we end up asking even more powerful questions like, what do I want to do with my life? And who am I really? As billionaire investor Warren Buffett once said, chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. And maybe that's how you feel, like you're being weighed down by this version of you that you've been pretending to be or had to be because of life. Imagine your life was an empty jar. If you're filling that jar with ideas and beliefs that are not yours, you're living a life that isn't yours. The first type of filler we put in our lives that blocks us from knowing ourselves is other people's opinions. So many of us are in constant disconnect with ourselves because we're always validating or verifying others' opinions of us. So, what do you think? We let others' ideas and beliefs define how we feel instead of being guided by our own values. Following others' opinions blindly can quickly get us lost. Before I decided to become a monk, I was training to be an investment banker or work in business. When I stopped to look at why I was chasing this career that I wasn't really interested in, I realized I was following my community's definition of success and not my own. This isn't me. Step back and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is it because it's what you truly want? Or is it because it's society's or someone else's opinion of what you should do or want? If you want to know yourself, and if you want to experience meaning and purpose, this is the kind of stuff you want to fill your life with. Your values should come first. When you isolate your values, you'll start to see more clearly what's important to you. You'll start to get a sense of your passion and your purpose, and you'll be able to start to see and understand what choices will bring you closer to the life of your dreams. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there.
Rule number five.